I would like to call the meeting to order and ask that our vice chair, uh, Hubert Levy, take roll call and let's see if we have a quorum. Okay, I'd be happy to do that. So um, first I will call on Chair Luis. Present. And I am also present. Uh, Commissioner Bocanegra. Present. Commissioner Bustos. Present. Commissioner Flores. Present. Oh, she's frozen. Mm -hmm. I heard her say present. No, Karen's frozen. Oh, Karen's frozen. All right, then uh, maybe I will continue. We had oh. Commissioner Flores uh, present. Uh, Commissioner Sadvik Nori. Present. Commissioner Amea Nori. Present. Uh, I'm, not, I'm going out of alphabetical order. Commissioner Wilson. Present. Commissioner Rasmussen. Here. Commissioner Swope. Here. Who did I miss? Uh, sorry, I'm here. This is Wesley. Ah, sorry, Wesley. <laughs> yeah. Commissioner All right. Lou. I'm not as, yes, I'm as good at this as uh, Commissioner Huber Levy. <laughs> who I think I just heard chuckle. Is she's back? I don't see her yet. No, okay, she's having connection issues. But uh, we do have a quorum, so that's great. Um, let's carry on and uh, I'm sure that Commissioner Huber Levy will rejoin. Uh, Commissioner Swope, I see your hand up. I move that we meet remotely for AB 361. I second. Thank you, could someone just jot down some notes as to who made the motion in the second. Um, maybe Commissioner Wilson. I see I'm going to elect uh, Amaya to do so as oh, one that's of the Wesley Amaya team. <laughs> he's going to become the vice chair of administration and co vice chair of administration on January 1st. Yeah, Amaya, why don't you do that until uh, Karen gets back? Although I see her back. All right, uh, commissioners, we, we have a motion and it's seconded to um, meet remotely per AB 361, which we are able to continue until March. Um, any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, great. The motion passes. No abstentions, I assume. Right, the motion passes and we will continue uh, meeting remotely. Um, I move approval of the agenda. Thank you, Commissioner Swope. I second that. Are there any changes to the agenda or suggested edits? Uh, could we start with education and then do YSC? That sounds good to me. Uh, any, uh, I are you making a motion, uh, Commissioner Nori? Sure, I can move to approve the agenda with switching education and YSC in item three. Is there a second? A second. Great. Any any concerns or discussion on that? Okay. So I think the motion on the floor is to adopt the agenda with the change that we will review the education inspection first uh, in section three, and then we will review the YSC inspection. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? Great. The motion passes, the agenda is adopted with that change. Uh, we also were able, thank you, uh, Commissioner Huber Levy, to get the uh, minutes from our last meeting when we discussed the other inspection reports um, done so that we can approve them here. And if there were any changes or comments or anything uh, to the minutes, regarding the other inspection reports, um, now's the time to discuss. <clears throat> I 
approval of the minutes. Thank you, Commissioner Swope. Is there a second? I second. Any discussion about the minutes? Any changes? Okay, hearing none. Um, all in favor of adopting these minutes, uh, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? All right, great, moving right along. Uh, the minutes are adopted. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we're gonna pause now for members of the public uh, to make public comment on items that are not on the agenda. And um, hello, Ms. Garcia, uh, I see your hand up. Uh, please go ahead. Hi, I just wanted to announce myself. My name is Angel Garcia. I'm a regional specialist with the Office of the Youth, Youth and Community Restoration. Thank you so, me, so much for inviting me to your meeting. Um, we did visit the San Mateo facility on the 6th. And so I'm really excited to hear your guys' reports um, about facility and other things. Thank you again for inviting me to the meeting. Thank you for being here. Welcome. Um, uh, Pat W, I see uh, you also with your hand up. Um, would you like to make a comment on something that's not on the agenda? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, I'm in a really sort of precarious position with this uh, connection because mm -hmm. I've just, jumped out of a <laughs> chemical situation, I should say. Um, so, I mean, I have chemistry around me, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> not, not like drugs, okay? We won't count this <laughs> towards your two minutes. Go it's ahead. photographic chemistry. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I just want to say that um, while it's mentioned in the, uh, in the audit report, um, it is uh, as a recommendation um, I I would say it's must have. I when I when I learned a while ago that uh, people in youth detention are uh, not able to have toiletries if they do something against the rules. I'm frankly thinking of third world countries and Soviet prisons where this kind of stuff probably happens. Um, it's unconscionable, I think, and unhealthy, I think, to say, well, because you did this little thing wrong, you know, we're going to take away your ability to wash your hair. Um, it's absurd. Okay, so that, that that's how I feel about it. I don't care if it's been inspected or recommended or whatever, whoever came up with that idea in my opinion, uh, visited some uh, Central American country where they treat prisoners like that. Thank you. Thank you, Pat, for your comment. And um, just to note that we that is a, I, that is something that is on the agenda. It's in the report. So we will, um, that is something that I think was going to come up. It's a recommendation, but uh, I appreciate you speaking up. Uh, Thanks a lot. Does, uh, does anyone else have comment on items that are not on the agenda? And I know, Ms. Jackwell, I received an email from you. I'm assuming you're gonna hold your comment until we get to the agenda item, is that right? Okay, hearing no other uh, requests for comment, um, Ms. Garcia, you can put your hand down uh, if you know how to do that in the uh, in Zoom, there you go. Thank you. Um, great. If there's no other public comment, we will move on to um, our main business for tonight, which is Section Three of the agenda. And as we amended the agenda when we adopted it, we're going to start with the education uh, inspection. So. Um, Commissioners Nori and Rasmussen, take it away.
All right, thank you so much. So Southwick and I, when we first started um, this inspection uh, period this year, we had a team of four. And by the time it came to inspections, our team dwindled down to two. So we lost commissioners Newton and Enriquez. So um, I just wanna say that uh, we were able to, um, I, I was pleased that we were able to do what we were able to do considering we lost half of our team. So I'm going to start and then Southwick will go ahead and um, complete. So I wanna start with, let's see here. There we go. What we learned. Can everyone see this okay? All right, what we learned. So, oops. So what we learned is that students uh, at Hillcrest are tracked after their release. I know that was something that this commission was very interested in learning. How do these kids fare once they leave us? What happens? What are the outcomes? And so we found out that they actually do have a system in place that uh, does track students. We've requested that information from Ms. Shelley Johnson, and she's assured me that she would uh, get that information to us uh, going forward. Um, but unfortunately, I have not received it um, as of, uh, as of today, but um, I can attach it as an addendum once it is received. I think that information is crucial to understand where our gaps are, where the holes are, where we're not, you know, um, helping our families and children transition back when they are released from the hall. We also learned, and when I say we, I mean our team, we learned that um, the school can offer vocations um, and actually uh, vocations that are done during the daytime are, are the responsibility of the school versus probation. So that was important. We also recognized, learned, I mean, we had heard from the children that they were very interested in, in participating in college courses, but we, we realized that we only are offering two courses, two individual classes at this point. And we've started our secure track now. So there's a desperate need for, um, for college programs that actually will result in a college degree, both AAAS, BA, and BS. Um, and um, also that uh, students will be, mostly our secure track students will be applying for financial aid and they'll be able to uh, deposit that money into a bank account that will be set up through the San Mateo Credit Union. So that is um, also something that we learned. And then I also learned that the school has a budget for books to expand the library. It was, I, I thought that was a facility budget item, but it's actually something that's budgeted for uh, with the school. So I am going to have uh, Sophic take over from here. Yeah, so, yeah, was, yeah, so next slide. Okay, there we go. So um, next we wanted to share some recommendations we had. So, you know, I think the theme of our recommendations are really saw is we saw how, you know, probate, the school does struggle because it doesn't serve, you know, a huge amount of students, but we all know that, you know, students benefit, especially those who might be more at risk or, you know, might not have always had a positive experience with our education education system really benefit from having a wide variety of opportunities. And, you know, I think that's kind of the theme of our recommendations. A lot of the stuff is things that we've, you know, um, talked about at previous education reports and both the County Office of Education and the probation department have worked on things, but we would um, recommend that they, you know, ins help ensure that youth receive timely IEP assessments and evaluations. Many of the youth either ha already have IEPs from their comprehensive high schools or would could really benefit and help their learning if they had an IEP and more broadly, like we talked about before, increasing opportunities for vocational and career technical education programs. Because when we talked with students, many of them really expressed hope and kind of an interest in doing, um, you know, in pursuing a skill, learning a trade, or, you know, having more opportunities and, you know, desires that would give them a sense of purpose or feel like there's more for them. So I think there's more that can be done there to give them a host of a, a banquet of opportunities that they can use, you know, in order to pursue and see a future after their time with us at, at Hillcrest. Um, we also, you know, a specific focus we'd like to emphasize was, you know, um, post-secondary education. I think for a lot of the youth, college is an option, but one that might not necessarily be something they're thinking of or even feel confident enough in themselves to think is a realistic choice for them. But I think, you know, our County Board of Education and the school in general can do more to push 
for students to, you know, have access to things they need to go to college, have access to have experience with college. You know, I think we're very happy with the partnership right now that offers them two community colleges or two community college classes that they can take a semester. But it also, you know, would be good for them to have more options because if they don't like the offerings, they're kind of, you know, stuck right now. So I think in general, having more options is a strong thing that we'd focus on in our recommendations and also providing student testing and post-release re-enrollment data to the commission because I think like we said you know we've always wondered what does happen to these students once they're released because you know we know that some of them do come back but the majority of them go back their comprehensive high schools and you know the high schools struggle themselves to keep track of everyone or understand these unique student circumstances so I think having a better focus on that pipeline but from um, Hillcrest back to their comprehensive high school or whatever their path, whatever school they're going to go to would really benefit us to ensure that we're truly serving these kids. Uh, next slide. And then um, some more recommendations for the probation department. So, um, you know, overall, we do think that the probation department is doing a good job and they have done a good job for these past two years in trying to ensure that our kids have access to an education while staying safe from COVID. So, you know, as the governor winds down the COVID-19 emergency, we think it's very important to continue to streamline COVID protocols so that youth are able to engage in school as soon as possible. We know we talked to some of the youth who said that in your, you know, for the sometimes like they'd be up for like a week or two just doing packets in their in their room and not actually able to go to school. So I think encouraging students to be able to go see a teacher, you know, be in that classroom environment as soon as is physically safe is really important to us. We also, you know, kind of in a similar theme, encourage them to have more recommendations or more opportunities for students in order to take advantage of whether it be offering virtual field trip opportunities for Hillcrest students or also allowing increasing the ability for camp camp students to go off campus you know experience and make school really really fun because I think that's something that's really important for these kids in order to help them you know fall in love with learning especially if they might have had a negative experience with school prior to coming or to to this environment so um, as usual you know I think the cooperation between the San Mateo County Office of Education and probation is very good, but we also agree that it can always be improved. Um, we'd also like to focus on encouraging youth to be educated beyond high school or the passage of a GED. Like we did notice a problem that uh, some of the youth had gotten their GED and seem to be sitting around, you know, not really doing much. So making sure that everyone that you say, you know, just because you got a GED doesn't mean you're done with school and you can just, you know, hang out all day, like encouraging them to pursue mm -hmm. stuff they're interested in past the, or at the post-secondary level is something that's really important. Um, and finally, um, you know, there was kind of a disconnect between when students are allowed access to technology. So we'd say how, helping to encourage that youth are allowed to use Chromebooks in their cells and in the housing unit so that they're able to pursue school and, you know, have have more stimulus and things to keep them busy when they're not actually physically in the classroom. And finally, providing additional support to students to help sure that when they're transitioning back to their home schools, the process is as smooth as possible and they're set up on a path to succeed. And finally, um, we, we also encourage them to work with the San Mateo County Office of Education to track post-release school re-enrollment data so that probation officers and staff themselves can identify and address problems in the system right now because we're almost certain that there are problems, but I guess without data, it's very hard to see, you know, what, what is a huge barrier or pitfall for students when they're transitioning. So I think having more data would be really clear and key in helping students address or, or helping us address the problems that these students might be facing. Um, so one thing we also really cared about was data. So we still requested the student outcome data. I think it was the MAP test um, for the facility during the inspection period. So once we receive this data, we will be included, we'll include it in an addendum report. But as of now, we don't have the data on student performance. And finally, commendations. So we we'd like to recognize a lot of the great work we saw. Every teacher we talked to was very inspired and you know cared deeply about their job. One teacher in particular, Mr. John um, Borde. Gary, sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. So he's been teaching children at Hillcrest for over 20 years and his dedication and commitment to educating our most vulnerable populations are truly exceptional and made a significant difference in the lives of countless children and family in San Mateo County. And we'd also like to thank Shelly Johnson, principal of Hillcrest School, Lauren Sneed, the school counselor and foster youth services coordinator, and everyone else at the school in their effort to help expand educational programming and opportunities for youth. And we see how hard they work every single day to ensure that our youth have everything that they need to be successful, not only at their time in the hall, but after they leave and transition back to their 
home environment. Okay, great. So commissioners Rasmussen and Nori, um, that, did, does that conclude the presentation? Did you have any other comments or anything? Oh. That concludes that, that, yes, that it concludes the presentation on uh, education. And if anyone has any questions, sorry, I have a little technical difficulties there. <laughs> If anybody has any um, questions or would like to discuss something for, oh, we see lots of hands up. All right. Yeah, why don't so, you just, you take it away. Uh, I, I don't need to- so I don't know who was and, first. Uh, and, and, and ask, it looks like Commissioner Swope got her hand up first. Okay, uh, Commissioner Swope. Uh, one thing that you don't note in, in this that I think is really important is that not only did the schools get a WASCO accreditation, which means that their credits are transferable to four-year colleges, but that was renewed for the longest period possible for I think four or five years. And I think that we should acknowledge that in, in this inspection report. Um, there was, you also had something in there about attending graduation. And that's something I, I think we would all benefit if uh, we could be told when there are important occasions being held at the hall. I've attended at least two or three graduations and it, it was very inspiring to see uh, the staff take a great deal of work to make it a special occasion and to make it as festive as possible and to make the graduating students feel the importance of their accomplishment. And I think that that is something that is worthwhile uh, observing. So I would ask if Ms. Clark could ensure that when something like that is going to happen, if you could let us know so that if we're able, we can attend. Um, I had one other thing, but I forgotten what it was. So thank That's you, Susan. I wrote those down so we can make those we can make those changes. Uh, who had their hand up next? Erin. Okay, Commissioner Huber Levy. Hi, thank you for that excellent presentation. Um, I participated in the education inspection last year with Melissa and I really echo your comments and appreciate how um, thoughtfully you've put this together and the focus that you put on following up and, and um, keeping track of the progress of the youth after they've left um, the facility. I just wanted to also mention that the Youth Bill of Rights uh, underscores the rights of all youth in detention to have access to post-secondary academic and career technical education and programs and access to information regarding parental rights, among other things. So that is now law um, and fully support all your recommendations. Thank you for doing such a great job on this. Thank you so much. Commissioner Wilson. Thank you. Um, so again, and I, I echo the concerns you have in your report, and I appreciate them being so comprehensively presented. Um, some of the things that I've been concerned about is whether we are ensuring that educational skills are being acquired. And if you don't measure those, you know, and so what they're planning to send to you has to happen. Um, the, the most important things to me that are that happen at the facility are education and behavioral health and education has to be excellent. It sets them up for a return. They are already coming from a deficit and I would like every opportunity to be being used. And in this age of the internet, there's no reason why every child should not have access to vocational tra training, college to the full extent. And there's a philosophical disconnect that I see when currently youth are allowed to not be educated because they're over 18 or they've completed their studies, studies and are allowed to instead fold towels and hand out soap. That shouldn't be acceptable because we are there to educate all youth all the time when they're in that facility. 
Um, and I, and while there is something to be learned about fo from folding towels, that's not the that's not the idea of education. Um, I think that's all I have to say, but making sure that we're tracking for their outcomes and tracking for their learning is uh, critical and that we're doing everything we can. And um, the school has done so much, but I think there's so many more opportunities. Thank you so much, Commissioner Wilson. Commissioner Bocanegra. Yes, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for that, uh, for that report. That's a great presentation. So just let me, I have a question. So we, they started operation, uh, we paid 156 million for these 180 cages that we have. Uh, we spent almost 2 million a year incarcerating these kids. We have no bulk uh, in this uh, educational department at the moment. No what? No vocational training. No, I believe there may be, Ms. Ms. Clark could probably be more specific in what is actually offered. There are no vocational programs. There may be vocational services. There may be like a company that has a contract to come in and maybe do resumes or, or skills, but not an actual vocation that you can learn a trade or get, you know, receive a college uh, degree. The things that are long-term youth are really going to need if we if they are going to be successful upon their release and if we are looking to reduce recidivism and increase public safety it is absolutely imperative that these children have what they need to be successful yes and i, so, I want to just make a, a comment on that on this on that very note because uh i think uh, it was just mentioned right now that the victim bill of rights demands that it is a right for secondary education uh, college. And from this inspection, it sounds like they're not even getting first degree education because if they are incarcerated in San Mateo County and they are receiving education in their high schools uh, for maybe auto shop or carpentry, once they become incarcerated, uh, they lose that education and we know there's no transitioning program that it helps these kids transition back in there. So I'd just like to say, uh, state that uh, it is absolutely um, unfortunate that these kids are being uh, held back from pursuing some sort of vocational training. And it's sad that this has been in operation for 2006 and there's a difference in education that is provided to kids that are incarcerated and kids in the community. And I think that that is just unfair because we know here in San Mateo County, 99% of the kids incarcerated are of color and they are underserved. So it sounds like, uh, you know, there definitely needs to be a follow-up on vocational training for education and, and uh, just question um, why kids are receiving a different level of education from high school as opposed to our schools here at our YSC where we're uh, incarcerating kids. Thank you. Thank you so much. Paul, I just wanted to say one thing. You, you mentioned the uh, Victim Bill of Rights, but I think you meant you meant to say the Youth Bill of Rights, just for our community members who are listening. It's the it's AB 2417 that was just signed into law this fall. I think that's yes. what you were referring to. Thank, thank you so much. Appreciate that. That's exactly what I was referring to. Thank you, Paul. Um, are there any other commissioners that have um, questions or comments on the report? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Commissioner Wilson, go ahead. I just, and, and the whole, I think the school staff know how much I love them. So this is not uh, undermining their commitment in any way, but I'm frustrated and tired of waiting for the youth to have a comprehensive educational program. Thank you, Commissioner Wilson. Um, any other commissioners that have comments or questions on the report? Okay, if there aren't any other questions or comments from commissioners, then, um, then I would open it up to uh, members of the public that would like to make comment on this report. Um, we also have the YSC report coming up and, um, and I, also want to note uh, 
the number of comments in the um, in the chat. Uh, so thank you for those, um, and those will uh, be in our transcripts, and so um, those are noted. Um, Ms. Keeler, I see your uh, hand is up. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, good evening, and thanks very much for this special session to address the this really outstanding report. I read through the entire thing. Um, I'm Becca Keeler. I'm from in Redwood City. I've spent most of my life here in San Mateo County. My father was a retired Lieutenant Menlo Park PD and was also the juvenile officer there. So juvenile justice is an area that's been really important to me for most of my life. And I'm delighted that JD, JJDPC uh, is supporting the probation department and our San Mateo youth in this manner. And I urge you to adopt this exceptional and thorough report as soon as possible. I second the comment just made as soon as possible. And I want to leave you with a quote that I think is apt here, but I'm afraid I don't know who to credit it to. And the, and the quote is, when humanity goes up, crime goes down. And the more humanely we treat our youth that go through the system, the more likely they are to come out as healthy, productive citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Nancy Goodben, I see your hand is up as well. Yeah, hi, thank you. And, and thank you all for this um, really comprehensive report. I live in Redwood City. Um, I'm with Fixin San Mateo County and San Mateo County Democracy for America and other groups as well. I just want to support these ideas. It's hugely important that the kids that we take away from their families and lock up get the same kind of education that they'd get if they were back in the community and that we prepare them educationally so that they can thrive when they get out it's otherwise we're we're you know putting obstacles in their way that are unnecessary and life is hard enough so thank you so much i support this report thank you uh miss keeler i'm assuming you don't have another comment and so and so you could maybe uh use the electronic device to put your hand down. There you go. Okay, good. Uh, are there any other members of the public that would like to make public comment on this agenda item? Okay, I think we're ready for uh, a motion to adopt this. Oh, can I make one comment? I just, is anybody from the school present at this meeting? Okay, thank you. I don't think we do. I think because it's a, um, well, it is a uh, extra meeting. So I'm not sure if they were able to change our schedule. Uh, well, I, if I could just add something, um, yeah. I did send a copy of the report to Ms. Shelley Johnson and letting her know that we were having this meeting. So they were notified that we would be meeting. Okay. This evening. Thank you, Commissioner Rasmussen. Um, Commissioner Swope. I move adoption of the report. I second. Terrific. And um, were there any edits or changes uh, that we need to note in the motion, um, Commissioner Swope? I know your initial comments, I think, said something about uh, maybe some edits. And and we can just say in the motion that, you know, edits as suggested by you during the discussion, uh, which I know that Commissioner Rasmussen noted, and we're, we're also recording, so we can go back. The only change was to acknowledge the WASCO accreditation. OK. OK, great. And if uh, I could add, and, and uh, Commissioner Hubert Levy had a suggestion to put some verbiage related to the, the new Youth Bill of Rights and how that relates um, to these topics. So those were the two amendments that I had noted. Uh, to, that you're planning to, to make yes. to the report as it's, uh, OK, sounds good. and. Um, before we go to a vote, uh, Ms. Garcia, uh, I did see your hand go up. Did you? Would, was there a comment that you wanted to add? Yes, I was just typing, but I'll but I'll um, I'll say my comment and then I'll share with you. Um, yeah. So uh, we're mentioned in the Youth Bill of Rights. We have new responsibilities under that bill. Um, if folks don't know, we are not an oversight body, so we cannot tell uh, probation departments or any other systems what to do. However, we can 
um, highlight best and promising practices. And we know for higher education, promising practices, and, and the bill doesn't say in what what types of, of post-secondary academic or career uh, CTE classes or programs, you know, need to be implemented, nor in the way in which they're implemented. So we see a lot of correspondence courses, which um, may pose some challenges or you don't get the full kind of um, experience of being in college. And so promising practices that we highlight include uh, online classes, um, and there is some new funding that's going to be coming out. Um, you, you would have to ask your local community colleges and probation if the community college is going to be applying for the Rising Scholars funding. The RFA is not out, but last I heard it will be out in January. And that new pot of funding, the Rising Scholars Network, um, uh, which is overseen by the Chancellor's Office, $25 million is put towards uh, programs per, per year. $15 million of that $25 million uh, is going to be going toward youth, um, serving youth, justice-involved youth, including those in facilities. And so what's being promoted by Chancellor's Office are, is a variety of things. But one of the things they talked about was um, increasing online opportunities and also coordination and agreements between community college districts. The challenges are when there's only a couple of kids, three kids, five kids trying to get a class going uh, as an online class is challenging, right? Poses, poses some logistics. And so the grant is really incentivizing those agreements um, between different districts and more coordination and then also supporting transition activities with youth. Um, so we, we do acknowledge that we are highlighted in that bill um, and we also want folks to know in the community that there is some new um, state um, opportunities and um, programming that's going to be coming out, out in the future to encourage um, more CTE and post-secondary opportunities. I apologize for being long-winded, but I can send um, you, Monroe, that language and that information about the new grant funding. That, that would be great. Um, thank you for that information and that comment and um, very informative. And uh, we definitely, I think with all of our recommendations, plan to be following up on them in, in the new year and, um, and we'll, we will get in touch. All right, uh, commissioners, let's move now, unless there's any other discussion, let's move to a vote to adopt this report uh, with those changes that we noted. Um, Commissioner Hubert Levy, uh, can you can you do roll call? I sure can, and hopefully my uh, screen does not cut out this time. <laughs> my internet does not cut out. Uh, Chair Luis, uh, in favor of adopting the report as amended. And I am also in favor of adopting the report as, with the amendments noted. Commissioner Bocanegra. Yes. Commissioner Bustos. Yes. Commissioner Flores. Yes. Commissioner Liu. Yes. Commissioner Amea Nori. Yes. Commissioner Sapik Nori. Yes. Commissioner Rasmussen. Yes. Commissioner Swope. Yes. And Commissioner Wilson. Yes. Wonderful. Unanimous. All right. So um, the report is unanimously adopted. Um, as written with those uh, few couple, just a couple of changes. Um, thank you very much, Commissioners Rasmussen and Nori um, for that report. And uh, uh, great to see that it is adopted. And thank you to all the community members for your, um, for your comments. Let's keep moving right along to, um, to item 3B, uh, the YSC inspection report. And um, it looks like Commissioner Rasmussen is ready to go ahead. So please go ahead. Okay, so this year's uh, YSC Inspection Team Youth Services Center, or as the community may know, Hillcrest Juvenile Hall, uh, the inspection team involved uh, Commissioner Bocanegra and Commissioner Safik Nori and myself. Um, let's see, we'll go to our next slide. Um, the statistical data for uh, the prior year or this year, this inspection period, we had 192 bookings, 187 releases. The average daily population was 17 males and one female. The average length of stay was 30 days with a median length of stay of four days. 
uh, out of county youth. Uh, we had 45 out of county youth and that'll be important later when we talk about uh, our electronic monitoring program. So 18%, a little over 18% of our youth are out of county youth, particularly the majority are coming from San Francisco. The average age is 17 and race 99% of our youth are youth of color. Um, one of the things I found to be uh, very interesting is that uh, city of residents, we asked, where are our youth coming from? What cities, are, where do they live? And, and so we could sort of figure out if we've got 99% youth of color, we need to figure out why that is, right? Is it, is it because of aggressive prosecution? Is it because of aggressive policing? Is it because um, just of the neighborhood that they live in? So we wanted to understand that. So we asked for that. And so the top city was Redwood City, followed by San Mateo and East Palo Alto and San Bruno were tied. I think it's important to note that South San Francisco has dropped off the top three. And I think they've done an exceptional job both at their, with their police department and their schools to um, really make a difference in um, keeping uh, their children uh, out of the juvenile hall. All right, so uh, the 2000 and last, basically our last in, uh, inspection period, the recommendations that have been implemented so far, excuse me for just a second. Um, okay, uh, so mattresses, uh, the youth are currently allowed to double up their mattresses. The new mattresses that were purchased about two years ago are really, really thin and not very comfortable. And one of the top complaints in the last inspection period was back pain and insomnia. So youth are now allowed to double up their mattresses to help with those uh, medical complaints. Uh, reduce sensory deprivation in cells. So youth are now allowed to hang personal photographs and artwork. And um, there, there was some confusion with some staff about what was allowed, but for the most part, everyone was on board and um, everyone seems to be much happier now, especially for our long-term youth. We have some kids who may be there five, six, seven years. And so making a space that is theirs that's not, you know, bare white concrete walls is very important. And so I'd like to commend um, Ms. Clark for putting these recommendations into place. As many of you who attend our meetings know, the youth now have pillows. That was a major victory. It might seem small, but it, it really, with um, these youth who have experienced trauma, who are facing uh, very critical, uh, you know, court proceedings, um, a pillow can make all the difference in the comfort level and re-traumatization -traum of a child. Uh, cups, youth are now allowed to have a paper cup inside of their cell to drink from so they don't have to put their mouths under the, the sink anymore to drink. And our institutional forms now include the proper pronouns uh, for self-identifying gender, um, which, is, um, which is wonderful. So our 2022, now these have been condensed for the presentation. Our report is 59 pages long. So this is a very condensed version, but I would encourage everyone to read the full report. So lock confinement, uh, what are our recommendations around lock confinement? Reducing the amount of times you spend in lock confinement, reduce sensory deprivation in cells by providing all youth with books, puzzles, Chromebooks for schoolwork inside of their cells, regardless of behavioral status or level. This is uh, especially important for youth who are in the quarantine phase um, during this uh, particular uh, inspection period. We had a quarantine phase that uh, required that you spent up to 23 and a half hours a day in their cells just to keep the facility safe and COVID under control, which was um, quite extreme and could be difficult, but uh, it did help stop the spread of uh, COVID-19 throughout the facility. Um, increase, increase programming and activities on weekends to reduce the amount of time youths are locked inside of their cells. Um, install individual storage units in each cell. And this would be with funds from our reimagined juvenile hall monies that were allocated through the Board of Supervisors. Uh, we feel that this would be an excellent use of these funds, especially uh, on the Pine 4 unit where our long-term youth are right now they have to store their things on the floor or on a if there's an extra bed there so giving them an institutional uh, storage unit would be um, would be highly recommended 
um, our electronic monitoring program. So um, I'm the court liaison for the commission. And I was surprised to learn when I, when I first started attending court that youths who live outside of our county, um, we do not provide them uh, EMP services. So what that means is if you are a kid from Alameda County and you would go to your arraignment and the judge says, okay, under your conditions, you are eligible to be released on home detention where they wear an ankle monitor, they check in with probation and they sort of, instead of being incarcerated, they, they do this at home. Well, in San Mateo County, we pay for our children to do this. There's no cost to the family, but unfortunately we, we don't have an agreement with the counties that surround us. So it, San Francisco, if one of our children from San Mateo goes to San Francisco, they pay they provide the service, they don't charge the family. Unfortunately, San Mateo County does not do that. And so families, um, the, the, they, the price of this service ranges from 50 to $100 per day. And as I think almost everybody on this call knows um, that our families simply can't afford that. So we need to ensure that um, children are not staying uh, in custody based upon their parents' inability to pay. Um, staffing levels. So uh, right now um, we're recommending that probation staff at, uh, bring on at least six uh, people into the YSC. Um, and that would be one per shift on both sides of the week to cover every shift. And uh, there's a total of 54 vacant positions. And, and I think that's a little bit that we have to put that into perspective because that would be if our facility was running at full capacity, which we know that it's not. But there are these positions are not being refilled. But we we desperately need to bring on more staff um, so we can ensure that if there was an emergency, if there was a death in a family or vacations or an injury, that the youth can continue to receive the programming and services, um, you know, at the facility. Uh, one of the issues that came up during our interviews with staff is they explained that during COVID, they had to, they had to change their shifts. They had uh, previously been working for 10 hour days, which many of the staff, they commute. So a 410 shift um, really is ideal for their families and it, it works well for their mental health and their physical health and financially. And so um, they felt that, um, that, that it was a huge sacrifice to go back to the five, eight hour shifts, but they did it because that was re what was required during the pandemic. So they staff expressed that it would improve communication to have overlap of at least, you know, an hour or two between shifts. So that extra between eight and 10 could be used when the next shift comes on. So they could talk about things that have been happening on the unit, maybe something with an individual child, um, but staff um, really feels that that would be beneficial to improve internal and external, uh, external communication, youth case management, and to meet the operational needs of the facility. And, and we agree. Um, additional staff training, staff uh, asked or suggested that uh, when I said, well, what, what kind of training would you uh, like to have? What additional training? What they mentioned was the uh, adverse childhood uh, experience assessment, mental health and trauma and abuse. Uh, communications, uh, housing unit staff would like biweekly meetings with service providers to discuss each use treatment needs and progress. Participation, uh, participants of this uh, biweekly meeting would be uh, members of BHRS, the educational staff, and the unit staff. Outcomes, metrics, and data capture data that can be used to measure the overall effectiveness of specific programming, treatment, and services being provided. Uh, notifications to the commission. So we would request that probation include any in their monthly report outs at our meetings to include any uh, major changes in policy, procedures, programming, or service changes um, in their monthly report. COVID-19 quarantine. So for youth who are in the quarantine phase of their detention, we would, we would request that behavioral health and recovery services check in with youth twice a day during that specific phase when they are in, um, when they are in their cells for longer periods of time. 
um, intake and admissions to implement the ACEs assessment as part of the intake process for every youth that enters the facility. Programming and services implement the nine core treatment programs that we recently outlined in a, in a recent commission meeting, increase the amount of large muscle activity whenever possible, change the dinner time from 5 p.m. to 5 p.m. to help alleviate nighttime hunger at bedtime and extend the programming day to end at 9.30. And this would be especially helpful during daylight savings time when it's still light outside. We further recommend that court orders be um, placed in it, that we um, do a better job at, at putting the court order, the data into the electronic system, just to streamline the data entry process and ensure that staff have immediate access to any you know, changes and in information that may have come from court. For instance, there's an order that, let's say mom can uh, have a visit at you know, five o'clock on Tuesday. And once that's, you know, get that into the computer. So then when mom comes on Tuesday, everyone can see it. We're not looking for a paper or, or we're just, you know, that we know that everyone has equal access to the most timely information. And then documentation, um, we, would, we would ask that probation place a copy of the inspection report um, on each housing unit so the children can see uh, what our recommendations are. They can see that they've had their voice has been heard in this process and that they have a better understanding of the work the commission does and the work that uh, we're currently working on. We also think it's important to provide elect an electronic copy to the staff for uh, very similar reasons. And we would like to see um, all documentation that goes out to parents in both English and Spanish. Um, and um, this, this policy and procedures on hygiene, this touches on Pat W earlier. Yes? There's a bunch of traffic on the bridge. Uh, I just uh, passed the Aurora? NGO. Aurora, can you mute yourself? Okay, I'm yeah, sorry. It was, it was like that when I went by. Okay, hold on just a second. I apologize. Sorry, everybody. I think you can mute her. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Thank you so much. Okay. So, um, policy and procedures. So this is relates to Pat W. So the commission urges the facility to exclude all hygiene products from the current behavioral step system. And we don't believe that a use ability to use proper hygiene products constitutes a medical exception, luxury or reward. One thing I, I want to clarify though, uh, with Pat's comment is that the youth do receive um, hygiene products and they're, they're never, not all of their hygiene products are taken away. They do have the standard issue hygiene products um, that they have access to. But what the problem is here is that most of our youth are youth of color. And so they, they have ethnic skin and hair that has a different um, needs. Like they need cocoa butter and, and they need, uh, they had just have different needs. And so last year as part of our recommendation is that we recommended that um, the facility discontinue use of of any hygiene or uh, hygiene products that are contrary to uh, the care and maintenance of ethnic skin. And so this is, this is uh, along that line. So currently if a child needs to have um, a, di a different lotion or uh, body wash than what's allocated, what's given by the facility, they have to get a, a, a letter from uh, the doctor saying that it's medically necessary or they're allowed um, once a year, typically it's once a year, um, community-based organizations come in and bring gifts. And in those gifts are hygiene products. And so in order to use those, those special products, the ones either that you would need the medical um, exception for, so the different, the alternative hygiene products, I should say, um, those are the ones that can be uh, taken away on the STEP system. So we just think that it's a, it's a good practice to just keep hygiene products out of that mix. Um, if a child needs to use uh, different hygiene products um, because of um, their ethnicity and they have different care needs, I think it's important that um, we provide that to them. All right, correctional health. Uh, create a medical record system. Currently, uh, this system is, there's a chart room and um, there is no uh, electronic system. So uh, that would be important to implement that. Ensure uh, every youth can receive a non-urgent eye exam within 14 days of the date of their request. Secure an optical services provider capable of producing eyeglasses and dispensing optical goods within 30 days of receiving a prescription. Increase dental services at the facility to twice a month. 
and procure an on-call emergency dentist who's available to respond to dental emergencies within four hours. And a dental emergency would include pain, infection, the loss of broken teeth, uh, and any additional condition that would be deemed urgent by correctional health or probation staff. Meals and nutrition, I think it's no secret uh, that uh, the new serv uh, food services contract has uh, caused quite a disturbance. And uh, while they are making efforts to uh, with, with different spices and like hot sauce and whatnot, um, the commission really urges probation to go back to their the program that they offered, the in-house food services pro program that they offered prior to the pandemic. Um, because as of right now, everything is provided through the San Mateo County Jail, through the Sheriff's Department. Um, behavioral health, we're continuing to advocate for a dedicated mental health space that is therapeutically designed for youth to receive mental health services in. Uh, facility repairs and maintenance, these are um, minor issues, but important. Uh, the basketball hoop needs a new netting and the soccer goal needs some attention. Uh, we are re recommending that two picnic tables be added to the outdoor recreation space. It's a beautiful space. It's one of the highlights of the facility, the running track, it, it's a beautiful space. So uh, we feel that adding two picnic tables would increase uh, the different uses for that. So they could eat outside, they could maybe do our projects outside, uh, maybe even do uh, school work outside, but adding those tables would offer much needed outdoor seating and would provide new ways to utilize that space. And this is also, um, these are also items that can be purchased using reimagined juvenile hall funding. Indoor, the furnishings, the current fur furnishings are made of metal and hard plastic. And so we would recommend that, uh, that the furnishing on the housing units be replaced. Um, with institutional furniture that's more home-like. Um, I know that was one of the goals of the Reimagined Juvenile Hall uh, project. And so um, we would encourage um, some funding to be used for that purpose. Programming rooms, making over the programming rooms on each of the housing units, also using funding from Reimagined Juvenile Hall. The makeover should include new carpet, paint, furnishings, equipment, shelving, and additional lighting. Showers, uh, the water temperature needed to be adjusted in two areas to allow for hot water. And there's a carpet that needs to be, be replaced on forest three. And the paint in the admi administration buildings, main hallway and the cement pillars on pine four also need repainting. So lastly, I'd like to um, commend staff, uh, probation staff. We with everything that is listed in this 59 pages, what you will not see is any mention that staff is in any way out of line, uh, that the kids are not uh, working well with staff. It's the exact opposite. The kids feel like they have someone that they could trust. They feel like they um, can relate to staff. Staff uh, conveys to us that they care deeply about these children. Staff is not the problem. We ne may need more, but staff is not the issue. It's um, basically programming and things that um, require some, some funding. So we'd like to we'd like to acknowledge officers Owens, CEO Whitley, Gonzalez, and ISM Chatty Galera for consistency for consistently going above and beyond to build and maintain positive relationships with our youth, for serving as mentors and role models and for assisting them in achieving their therapeutic goals. We are grateful for their dedicated service. And that concludes our presentation. And as soon as I can get out of the screen, there we go. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Rasmussen, um, and yeah. to the inspection team for, uh, for all that. I did read all 59 pages and uh, and I'm sure the other commissioners did as well. There's a lot more in the report for members of the public. Um, uh, I think we're gonna go to questions and comments from commissioners first. So um, Kate, I see your hand up, but if you could uh, stand by until we give commissioners an opportunity to uh, ask questions and make comment and, um, and then we'll get to you in the public comment. <laughs> hand up and thumbs up, okay. Lots of emoji communication, uh, but all very clear. Uh, um, 
Oh, Commissioner Rasmussen, I'll let you take it away uh, uh, and call on the commissioners. I think I think I see Commissioner Huber Levy um, with her hand up first. Okay, Commissioner Huber Levy. Thank you so much. And I did read all 59 pages as well and the um, add add-ons to it. And uh, what a fantastic, comprehensive, and caring assessment of this facility. And I think that the commendations that you gave are well earned and your comments hopefully will be taken to heart in terms of how it is intended, which is to provide these youth with the best opportunity to go forward um, with new skills and new hope. Um, so I really appreciate all the, all the time and the effort that you and your team spent, um, the hours that you put into this. Um, I had a couple of little questions, one on the optical, and I think you might have mentioned sometime before that some kids come in and it's clear that they have had vision issues which could impede their ability to, um, you know, their, their academic progress. And um, the suggestion is to provide them with an optical assessment and then um, a prescription for 30 days. But I'm wondering if, if 30 days sounds so long, if these kids, this is kind of the chance to get them um, some help with, you know, if, if they really do have a, a need, a disability really, um, if we should be pushing for a shorter turnaround time. <laughs> So, so just so I could clarify on that, so it was 14 days to get an appointment for an eye exam to find out just what they need, and yeah. then it was 30 days from receiving the prescription for the eyeglasses to be made and given to the facility. And um, 30 the reason why the 30 days was chosen in the 14 days, if, for most of us with our health insurance, it, it could take about mm -hmm. two weeks to get an appointment, and yeah. it, takes about, it takes about for me, it takes about 30 days to get my glasses. So I felt that that was reasonable. Um, okay. But I'm, of, of course, open to <laughs> any suggestions. I I don't know um, it, for an institution how difficult that would be to, mm -hmm. to get into a contract with someone. But I think it's important to outline those specifics and whomever is contracted to provide these services. So there is some timelines and we aren't extending. Um, this was the first during this inspection, this was the first that this issue had come up. I must tell you, the glasses are very handsome. The kids love them. I was just surprised that it took so long to get them. I, yeah. I was really surprised. It was the first I had learned of it. Um, but I'm guessing that um, that just has to do with the provider. And we just need to get a, a new provider is, is what I'm Yeah. Thinking. I mean, it does sound like kind of an urgent need and yeah. there's an opportunity to intervene for these kids who may not be in YSC that long. If the, the, you know, the range of stay seems so flexible. Like that was actually another one of my questions. Cause you mentioned some of the youth might be in the YSC for five to seven years. Mm -hmm. Would that be the secure track youth? That we're yes. Talking? Yeah. And then the other youth are there around 30 days. So and most of the majority of youth are only there for four days. So the majority uh -huh. of youth who come, they're released usually on home detention or mm -hmm. so, you know, usually those kids are the ones who come in on the Thursday night or a Friday. And then by the time they get to court on Tuesday, then they go home. So the median stay is four days. But mm -hmm. our long term kids, like the ones who stay a little bit longer is 30 days. And then yeah. we have our um, then we have the new secure track youth who. Um, that'll be a significant amount of time because we the um, children will for the public just so the public knows secure track is now what the county uses we used to use the what's called cya or djj and that's closed the, the state is we can no longer send children to uh, children prisons in california so the children stay here with us and they'll be incarcerated they can be incarcerated until they're 25 in this county so we don't send them away anymore just for clarification for anyone who may not have known that. Go ahead. Oh, is there just one other point about the food, which um, is a big issue. And we know that teenagers need to need to eat. And they're, you know, a lot of them are probably still growing and that impacts their ability to interact and to receive information and to be positive about their future. Um, so the, and eating at four o'clock in the afternoon just does not, does not sound very practical or um, appropriate in terms of a long night ahead of them. Um, 
The other thing I noticed in the actual written report was that there were some medical visits associated with the food, but there was not, it's not a food poisoning thing, but there were some like medical reactions to food. I'm not sure that I'm, I'm not sure that I understand. I know that if a child, uh, if a child is not getting, doesn't feel that they're getting enough nutrition, they can go to the doctor ah, and the doctor okay. will prescribe additional. Ah, that's food. probably what it was. Okay. Yeah. Yes, got it. Okay. Well, let's say they're still hungry because they also want to, um, they, they, you know, I, I don't think we have any children that are overweight in the hall right now, but they, um, so there's a balancing act, right? They don't want their children to, to be unhealthy and overweight, but right. the children who are underweight or still hungry, then they can go and be evaluated and then they can get it like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or extra uh, food that way. I think that's probably what you're speaking about. Yeah, that, that clarifies that. Thank you so much. And I will take my hand down and let others ask their questions. Thank you very so thank much. Thank you again for all your hard work on this. All right, thank you very much. Commissioner Swope. Hi, Commissioner Rasmussen. This is, I must say, the most comprehensive inspection report I've seen in the 13 years that I've been on the commission. And I, I really commend you and, and um, commissioners Nori and Boca Negra. Um, as far as the meals go, just restoring it to the way it was, is not going to help because it's never, the, the young people have never liked the food and I've had lunches and dinners with them and I couldn't eat it a lot of the things myself. I found it the mostly unappetizing. And when we talked to the nutritionist about this, she'd say that it, it met all the requirements for teenage nutrition. And I'd say, but if they won't eat it, they're not getting the, the food value of the food. They need, they need to be given food that they will eat. And every time I've had a meal with them, an awful lot of the food has just been thrown away. So that is something I think maybe we need to get, uh, oh, I don't know how we, we get movement on that, but I think we really do. Um, and I noticed that you have a lot of, of recommendations that are to be paid for by re reimagining YSE funds, but how much money is there? And do we have, we have probably no idea of how much these changes would cost. Um, I think that Monroe and, and Paul have been on, on the committee that looks at that. So that's something I think we need to follow up on. Um, I mean, we could do things to make the, the rooms a lot better. Excuse me. <clears throat> if we just had them painted and it would be even better if, if you could take out the the cement that's the, the bed and put in a bed, perhaps like they're using in Santa Clara at their camps. Because I think the problem is you don't want to have anything there that they can use as, as a weapon against themselves or others. But uh, on the other hand, if they aren't sleeping and if they're getting back aches and, and all that sort of thing, that can affect their the physical development. Um, permanently. So I think we probably do need to look at that more. Um, I have more, more notes, but I, I think I'll let somebody else have something to say. So if I could just address the reimagine, reimagining juvenile hall funding. So these, like the two picnic tables, and I know furnishings are expensive, but um, you know, the two picnic tables and the storage units, we're and the therapy room, we're talking under 5,000. I know we've been given money by the state for our secure track and we have the money from the board of supervisors. How much money do we have, um, Commissioner? Yeah, just, to, just to clarify, I was gonna clarify your previous comment. Um, the, the money that is specifically for reimagined juvenile hall as opposed to what's been allocated for secure track. Um, first of all, it was part of state funding. So the state, allocated about one and a half million dollars for San Mateo County. Um, there was a hundred million dollars in the state budget for juvenile halls across the state that was then distributed and San Mateo County will get about a, a million and a half. So that that's not that's not provided just to clarify that's not provided by the Board of Supervisors. It yes. is clarified but it is provided by the state. 
So the reimagined juvenile hall funding that we that you and um, Paul went and, and we formed the subcommittee that was not money allocated by the board of supervisors. No, um, uh, the reimagined juvenile hall committee has been meeting over this past year to discuss ideas um, and and, uh, and to come up with a process and funding for um, for how to make renovations to the hall uh, and. During the course of the past year, the state passed its budget and included in the budget was $100 million for juvenile halls across the state, of which San Mateo County gets a million and a half. So that's what's being used, what, what we know now can be used for changes that are recommended in that committee and changes that are recommended in these inspection reports. So there, I, there's a potential for additional money from the Board of Supervisors, but that hasn't been voted on or approved. Well, that's very important because I thought they were um, they, they, like they were two separate things. I didn't realize that they basically only approved that we would have meetings. I didn't know that, right? Like I thought that I'll, uh, I'll, the, actually that. agenda item C, uh, 3C, it, I, I realized that I miswrote here and it should be edited. It's, it, it, it's referring to a summary of recommendations for the JJCC. It's actually for the Reimagined Juvenile Hall Committee, which is its next monthly meeting is in two days. Um, but anyway, sorry, I, okay. that, we'll get to that in, in, in so, 3C, but back perfect. to, you, uh, back so to your I, report, yeah. I think that um, with 1.5 million, I think we can get some picnic tables and I think we can get some storage units. I think, I think we've got some money <laughs> and I don't think we're anywhere near exhausting it. And so I'm very hopeful that others will have some ideas on how we can spend that money as well. Okay. One, I had one other thing that is imp I think is important. Yes. Um, a couple of years ago, our commissioner, Clara McAvoy, went through the process of being admitted to the hall. And she had a recommendation that the intake interview be conducted privately instead of standing right in, in the middle of everything with three or four people listening when you're being asked about your sexuality and your drug use. And I wonder if that has been implemented or not, because that certainly should have been. I, I did not um, hear anything about that. Um, there was no, during our inspection, there was nobody going through the process and that wasn't something that was mentioned. I, when I was in admissions, there was two staff members there. So I guess we would have to ask Ms. Clark um, that uh, Ma Clara McAvoy was before my time, so I didn't just, know that. Just to, to just sort of point of order, I guess, like uh, let's focus on what's in the report now. And if we want, if 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 Commissioner Swope wants to make any edits to it, uh, to say add that point, then we can do that, or we can just follow up on that, you know, in January, and it doesn't necessarily have to be in the report. So I just want to clarify. So keep us focused on the reports so that we can get it approved on time tonight. <laughs> well, I'm, I was just thinking that that should be part of, of what happens at intake. Would you want to add that recommendation to, we can add that recommendation if it's already being done, then it's done, but we then can maybe can just add fine. that recommendation to the report. No, okay, and okay. fine. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Swift. Um, who was next, Commissioner Bocanegra or? I think Commissioner Wilson had her okay, hand. Okay, Commissioner up. Wilson. Uh, I have one suggested edit. Uh, you have a section on probation, a request for probation report outs. Mm -hmm. And I would add to that to report out on serious incidents. We have an MOU with the probation department in existence. Um, and I don't know that it isn't being honored, but I feel like there have got to be things that are going on that we're not hearing about in the category of violence or suicide. And that was what the MOU covered. So that's, I'd love to see that added. The, your report surprised me, so good job. Um, and the two things, the two of the things that I was surprised by, because I know about the food, was I had no idea that quarantine had youth in their cells for 23 and a half hours a day. I actually had a question about whether that is still the case or not. Uh, so I'll, I'll piggyback on that comment um, because I know that, that quarantine procedures have recently been changed because of new CDC recommendations. 
True. So during this inspection period, which was August to August, this is what was happening. The, 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 chain, the uh, protocols changed on September 2nd. So next year that will be reflected. So we have to be mindful to include okay. that was great. a snapshot of this inspection period. Okay, great. I was going to have a big freak out. So thank you. Not happy about it from before, but-, but uh, I think the recommendations are still in order because we never know with this pandemic. We may go yeah. back. And so I think it's important to, to keep it on the record. And um, even though I, I knew that they had changed, I felt that there is an opportunity, it may go back. So that's why they're included. So state law eliminated solitary confinement for more than four hours period and having a child in the room was limited, right? As being inhumane and COVID shouldn't be able to take that away quite so easily, um, especially when the outdoors is an option. So that, that was a, a moment of shock for me. Um, the other is it never occurred to me that youth were not going to visit their therapist at an office, but were having therapy in public in the programming room on unit. I never knew that. And I can't think of a less therapeutic dynamic than to do therapy in front of windows in an open space. And I don't understand why there's not, I don't understand why I'm learning this now and I don't understand why there's not a room somewhere um, for each behavioral health staff member to meet with a youth in private. And those are my comments. Thank you, Commissioner Wilson. Commissioner Bocanegra. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and I was trying to get in there earlier, but everyone was just going at it. But I did want to mention that that reimagined juvenile hall, uh, the last meeting we had, Chief uh, Keen mentioned that we do have one and a half million dollars. He's open to recommendation. I believe lockers, uh, I, I don't, I can't even imagine who created or who put the blueprints together for this uh, juvenile adult-like prison that we have here in San Mateo County. Uh, because when I was in Pelican Bay, where I spent more than 14 years at, 12 years in solitary confinement, I always had a locker. It was a cubby hole where I can put my food, fold my, my socks and stuff up to put, put away. And we have a, a, a solitary-like confinement prison that doesn't even have lockers for kids to put anything in like they're placing it on the floor like animals we just got them a cup this year um so one and a half million to say uh, the least is plenty to soften the environment which we're tasked with and i think that some of the recommendations here the furniture uh, even the visiting room furniture need to make like immediate changes uh, and swap some stuff out. V visiting furniture, if the kids can use it in visiting, why can't they use it in, in, in the unit? It, what's the difference? They sit on it in visiting in front of their parents and then they go and sit on a prison-like stool uh, in the unit. It just, just doesn't make sense that they're treated differently. Softening the environment of visiting and then hardening it when they walk away from their families uh, is absolutely cruel and excessive punishment for any youth. Um, again, behavior health space, it's being done right there in the unit. If the kid wants to open up and process some trauma and begins to, to cry, uh, that will be done in the presence of all the other youth. All the other youth will be aware of who's going in to take advantage of behavior health services. Uh, again, absolutely no privacy. And, and I'm not sure privacy is a right uh, in, in uh, incarceration. Uh, but that is definitely something that is clear here that uh, you lack that privacy here in San Mateo County. Um, and then programming for the youth. We are incarcerating kids, absolutely no rehabilitative or restorative justice programming, uh, no victims impact, no anger management. They're, they're not receiving invoked. So we are incarcerating children in this prison-like uh, environment. And then they are re-entering our communities, our neighbors right here. They come back into our public schools after experiencing uh, this reflex conditioning punishment model that, th that exists. And then they transition back into our neighborhoods uh, and lack the skills 
um, that they've missed all along. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you so much. And great job on your presentation. You did very good, Joanna. Thank you. Thank you very much. I didn't, I didn't estimate how much talking it would do. So uh, yeah, thank you um, for that. So I know Ms. Clark, um, she mentioned that she had some updates. So I wanna make sure we get those included before there's any vote or, and make sure that those edits are also included. So before we go to Kate, could we have Ms. Clark address? Um, she's, she's been working hard on this. And so I wanna give her the opportunity to speak. Would that be okay? Please go ahead, Ms. Clark. Oh, no, I was just going to mention just some of the, the things are already in and I won't take up too much time because I know our time is limited, but a lot of the recommendations are already um, have been in the works. And so I'm glad Joanna mentioned that this was during COVID. And so um, just a, a lot of the things, even like, you know, someone mentioned benches and, and things like that, we've already um, looking towards those those changes. So more more to come. Thank you, Ms. Clark, and 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 please know that you know this commission remains committed to being partners with you, and and if you need the funding, we're willing to go out and pound the pavement and get it. So and it, no, and that's good to hear. <laughs> I think one of the things, and you know, and in, in that are frustrating is like when you're talking about vocation and things like that. I know, even though it's school related, but on our end, I think just unfortunately with us being San Mateo County. And you know the differences in some of the other counties is that they're not here. So with this being you guys all working with community and coming across different people that are out there and offering services, really stressing that because you know they're they're not coming. We put out RFPs. We just you know are putting something out, and you know we're not getting the responses. And so um, you know just just for you guys to know, you know if you can get those connections, that's the things that are, are, are lacking is that people aren't coming. So thank you. Oh, wow. Thank you. I'll get you, I will get you some in one week. You will have some RFPs. <laughs> thank you so much. Kate, thank um, you so much for your patience. Wait, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Commissioner Rasmussen. Uh, um, I just wanted to, I, I also had some questions. So before we um, get to public comment, uh, I just wanted to finish off with all the commissioners. Uh, and, and I'll say, Ms. Clark, thank you so much for, for being here and for staying um, uh, all this time. It's really critical that you were here um, for, this, for this report. I know we're about seven minutes away from seven o'clock. We advertised that we would go until seven o'clock. Um, so I, I wanted to make a motion that, that we'd be willing to extend the time to say 7.15. Does, is that uh, work for commissioners? And um, could I get a second on that? I second. Great. And and commissioners, uh, anyone object to staying until 7.15 to, so we can get this business completed? All right, hearing no objection, we will extend the meeting to 7.15. Um, and now I, I, just, I, I did have one, uh, one question uh, around staffing. Um, first of all, I was surprised to read that, that the facility currently has 80 staff uh, when we average about 20 kids. Um, and, and certainly it's a big facility and you have to staff at 24 seven. So I understand um, why, you know, there, there, there does need to be a, a large number of staff, but, um, but I, I was wondering about your recommendation in the report to add six staff. Uh, and, and the thing that I was wondering is, how did you get to six? And, um, and is there a possibility of repurposing some of the 80 that we have already? Um, I, I mean, one thing that we talk about frequently when we, when we talk about juvenile hall here is, is like how expensive it is to operate, how expensive it was to build, how expensive it is each year to operate. So I'm sensitive to, I, I I'm com in complete concurrence that there are areas where we need more support or more resources, like an on-site food program, right? Which might, which would surely be more expensive. Or in my, in the report that Commissioner Flores and I wrote on Camp Kemp, we recommended more staff 
so that they could staff overnight and uh, the youth at Camp Camp would not have to go back to the YSC to sleep. So all of these are increases in resources, but what I'm, I, my, my long-winded question here is I'm wondering if there's a way of reallocating some of existing resources uh, so that the budget doesn't necessarily have to go up, but that we can better use the budget that we do that we have. Uh, so, thank you. so, so, yeah. How did you get to six additional? Okay. And so, the, thank you for that question because I think a lot of us have the knee-jerk reaction, like, "Wait, there's 20 kids there. Why are there 14 staff for each shift? Like, what what's that about?" Right. But I can tell you. So, the number. How did we get to the six? So there's two sides of the week, right? So there's two sides of the week, there's three shifts per day. So you add one per shift, both sides of the week. It's adding one, uh, one additional staff member. Why did we request this? Because the kids told us, we need more staff. We can't do our programming, we need more staff. The staff mm -hmm. told us, we need more staff. It's affecting morale. It's affecting what we can do here. We could do so much more if we had more staff. We talked to the parents. They said, we need more staff. So they know they're there, that they're the experts. And when I looked at it and it was uniform. And so what good is it to have, we could, what if we've got all these programs, but if they can't utilize them because there's not enough staff, we're back to zero. So I this see. is why we came with the six, using the information that we received from youth, staff, and their parents. So that's essentially, so just to clarify, that's essentially one more person per shift, essentially. Yes. Other yes. than the, uh, aside from the overnight shift, uh, because you're right. talking about the 16 hours of the day that is not the overnight shift. Right, and I, I also want to, I also want to uh, point out that that 80 number, is that those that are on the books that may they may not be actually showing up to work they may be out on injury they may but that is the right. number of people who are employed um at that facility that's you need to have backup for vacation and sick days exactly and as well, right? injuries you know yeah. life life happens and so i think during the pandemic they repurposed as much as they could but it was at the the expense of staff and it was at expense of the kids and everyone was trying, no one intended for it to cause, the, for there to be unintentional consequences. But I think now that we know, I think adding one additional staff, we're not saying fill 54, we're not saying fill 20, we're just, let's add one more. So in the, in the event that, you know, something comes up, the kids can receive what they need and, and the staff Done. remain safe. So that, that was- I did have, I thank you, Commissioner Raston. And I did have one other comment, um, which, for your consideration to add to the report. Um, when I did in my interview of a resident at Camp Kemp, she told me that, that um, one of the reasons why they bring water bottles um, over to Camp Kemp when they sleep there uh, is because the quality of the water coming out of the sink in the, in the cells is not very good. She said it was nasty, cloudy is what she said. I don't know if that's changed or not, um, but you had a recommendation actually in the report about drinking water and um, adding coolers. And my suggestion is that just as the youth at Camp Kemp have water bottles that they take with them to sleep at night, um, that that might be something to do for, um, for youth at the hall as well. Um, if, especially if the quality of the water coming out of the sink in the, in the cells is still not good. Yes, I'd like to see the water bottles as well. I think mo most of us would, but I don't know if there's an issue with, you know, whether or not that's allowed. Like we, we right now, I believe they have paper cups. So it could be a security issue. I'm not sure. We'd well, have well to the girls from Camp Camp bring water bottles over to the YSC and into their cell when they sleep. So it might, it might be possible. But anyway, I don't want to take up too much time with that particular suggestion, but I would offer that as something you might want to add to the, to the recommendations. Thank you, Commissioner Lippies. Yeah. And um, Commissioner Bocanegra's hand is up. Uh, so Paul, jump in here, but let's get the public comment also. Yes, on that note, um, that's one thing that I'm not sure we inspected was the like the levels of arsenic in the water. Uh, when I was serving time in, 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 uh, in, 
adult prison, many of the prisons above the water faucets have a memorandum putting you on notice that there's high levels of arsenic in there. Mm-hmm. By law, they have to give us notice, even though we're forced to drink it, there's nothing else to drink. Um, so yeah, if you could put that in there with Monroe's uh, addition that we can check arsenic levels just to make sure that that water is, uh, is safe to drink. Thank you for that, Monroe. Yeah, and maybe there's something um, just sorry, thinking out loud about uh, building inspection um, that covers that, uh, Commissioner Ashton. So something to follow up on. Okay, so uh, let's get to public comment, uh, if that's all right with commissioners, if they don't have any other questions or comments. Great. And um, Kate has been patiently waiting. And uh, uh, Kate Heaster from Fly, please go ahead. Thanks so much. No, I, I really appreciate the discussion. I just, just left it up there for the whole time. Um, but in any event, um, so one thing, a couple of things. So first of all, yes, definitely appreciate the how thorough this report was, um, like really amazing work and really appreciate how deeply you all looked into it. So thank you. Um, uh, one piece that I definitely wanted to underscore um, was around the quarantine. And I do know that things have changed and you know things are changing and also that um, staff are bound by you know, what the public health decrees are and things like that. But I wanted to share one conversation that I was part of. Um, we had two young men um, who had both spent time in um, our juvenile hall, one in the past year, one about 10 years ago. Um, and they both had a similar experience that the first couple of days that they were in that institution and unable to leave their cells for very long and also unable to connect with anybody else was some of the hardest time that they spent. Um, and what the, the young man that had been in several years ago had been in many facilities at DJJ, in adult prison, um, and he said that, you know, of all the time he spent, those first few days where he had no contact, he didn't really know what was going on, were some of the hardest. And I, I know that our, our staff know that, um, but I just wanted to really underscore that that impact um, was really significant. Um, so the, as much as we can do to, to minimize that time, um, I think is really critical for our young people because... I mean, it's all important, um, but it was just a really impactful moment for them both to, to have that same experience 10 years apart. Um, so that was one piece. Um, unfortunately, I, I did have a youth that was able to join for a moment, but unfortunately she had to drop off because she had another meeting at seven o'clock. Um, but she um, was actually part of a meeting that we got to have with OYCR recently. Um, so I will just share one thing that I had her permission to share um, that she shared with them. Um, so she was in uh, this past spring, so February, March, um, and she said one of the issues that she wanted to raise was um, the feminine hygiene products. Um, there really weren't enough options, um, that really there, there wasn't a range of uh, specifically pads. Um, so there was like a range of tampons um, for different flow days, um, but not uh, a range of pads. And so um, she really didn't feel that that was great um, and really wanted to have people look into that um, so that girls get what they needed um, for their for that piece. Um, but I will leave it at that um, and pass it to other folks. Thanks so much. Hey, can I ask such a quick <laughs> clarifying question on that last bit? Was, yes. was that, do you know if she meant in the hall or at Camp Kemp or both? I believe at in the hall because I don't believe that she was at Camp Kemp. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Kate for that and um, Ms. Clara Jackwell, and I hope I'm saying your last name right. Um, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so yeah, my name is Clara Jekyll. I live in Redwood City. Um, I'll mention that I'm a member of the Redwood City Police Advisor Committee. I'm not representing or speaking for the committee right now, but just speaking in part out of my experience there. And handling youth has been a hot topic in Redwood City over this past year. So I wanted to say everything I've seen indicates that um, Preventing recidivism is about strengthening the ties between youth and their community and helping them see a place for themselves within it and includes strengthening their sense of dignity and self-worth and the understanding that they matter to and in the community so they don't feel disengaged and disenfranchised. And I say all of that to say I really want to underline the points about not treating some of these recommendations as luxuries or special privileges, um, including food that's appetizing and culturally appropriate, the toiletries that are appropriate for hair and skin, as we've heard um, the dedicated mental health room with privacy for the therapy sessions and so on. Um, and going back to the education report, and I can just mention that also includes showing them realistic, legitimate opportunities for themselves to support themselves and thrive. And just to say that these are not special favors to grand or yank away. Um, these should be treated as basic and necessary provisions to make it possible for them to be healthy members of the community. 
So I just really support all the recommendations and look forward to them being implemented. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. And um, Ms. Jackal, thank you for being a regular attendee of our meetings as well. Uh, I, I recognize your face and uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm glad to see you here every month. Um, <laughs> uh, Nancy Goodbun. Yeah, just, I mean, thank you for this incredibly powerful and stunning report. As a parent, a grandparent, a taxpayer, you know, we are responsible for these kids. We owe them a chance. We owe them a chance to get better and to thrive. And the minimum we can give them is decent food, a place to sleep, a place to have private therapy, um, vision and dental care. So I really urge you to, to adopt these recommendations. Thanks so much. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public uh, that would like to comment before we move to a vote on this report? All right. Then I think it's time to uh, uh, that someone make a motion to adopt uh, this report. And are there is it a is it an are we adopting the report as is or or were there suggestions i think there were right yeah i i motion i move that we adopt the report with the edits suggested by susan and by uh, melissa and paul I, and kate oh i'm sorry yes <laughs> and and paul Thank you. and, and <laughs> the Monroe. suggestion made by kate yeah i guess who's not a commissioner just to be clear but uh um we can take that comment uh paul sorry do, did you want to say something no, no, good. Okay. Uh, I, is there a second? You don't need a second. It's a committee report. Thank you for always reminding me of that, Commissioner School. <laughs> I got. I'm going to get that right one of these days. Uh, uh, any further discussion or comments? All right, Commissioner oh. Hubert Levy. Let's uh, let's do a roll call vote on this. All righty, so Chair Labuis. In favor. Uh, I also approve this report in, in favor. Um, Commissioner Bocanegra. Yes. Commissioner Bustos. Yes. Commissioner Flores is, had, had to leave the meeting, so Commissioner Liu. Yes. Commissioner Amaya Nori. Yes. Commissioner Sadvik Nori. He had to leave the meeting as well. All right. Uh, Commissioner Rasmussen? Yes. Commissioner Slope? Yes. And Commissioner Wilson? Yes. That's it. All right. Terrific. Uh, the report is unanimously adopted, or sorry, approved. And, um, and I want to echo what everyone else has said here, which is um, this was incredibly thorough and um, these are important recommendations, and I am committed uh, as the chair of this commission to making sure that we follow up on them in 2023. Um, we, these inspection reports, not just the one that we just approved, but all four that we have now approved, um, uh, really have a lot of great information in them and recommendations that I think really help us establish uh, a, a good deal of what we can work on in 2023. So um, kudos to the entire commission for getting through this inspection process and um, especially to Commissioner Rasmussen for leading us through it as the inspection chair this past year. Thank okay. you. Yeah, I, I wanna thank both um, Ms. Rasmussen and also Chair Labuise. This is the first year where we are requesting feedback from the stakeholders in response to the reports. And that is, that's going to make sure we have a continuous loop of communication so that we don't write reports, send it out into the ether, and then don't know what happened with recommendation. So to everyone here, I encourage you to tune in um, because there will be response to all the reports that we've done over this recording period. Uh, yeah, and those and will be posted to publicly as well. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Wilson. And and so in the, in the last few minutes that we have, I'll... Um, I'll move on to agenda item 3C as well, which as I mentioned earlier, I should have mentioned at the when we approved the agenda that 
it should be edited to say um, summary of recommendations for reimagined juvenile hall committee, not for the JJCC. Uh, and I, I, I've said it before, but the next meeting of the reimagined juvenile hall committee is in two days and um, probation has uh, been working on a memo uh, for ideas um, for improvements to the hall that we can that we can use the one and a half million dollars for and um, and through that committee they also invited this commission to um, submit our ideas so I had let them know that we were in the process of improving of approving our inspection reports which were full of recommendations um, and that we would be getting back to the committee so to that end, um, I want to make a motion that uh, I, I want I want to move that the commission uh, authorize uh, myself and Commissioner Rasmussen to meet in the next day or two to to write up a, a summary of the recommendations across all the reports so that we can we can submit that to the uh, reimagined juvenile hall committee. And I, I guess I'll amend the motion to say to include Commissioner Bocanegra also in that, of course, since he's part of the Reimagined Juvenile Hall Committee. Is I was gonna say, I'll submit my list separately. As well. <laughs> uh, sorry, Paul. Right here. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, Commission, I'm asking for your approval that, that the three of us can get together, write up a summary of all these recommendations and then submit that to, that, to the Reimagined Juvenile Hall Committee. Yes, Monroe. <laughs> I'll second you that. have my let's permission. Have a, let's have a quick voice vote on that. All commissioners in favor? Yes. Aye. 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 Anyone appro uh, uh, not approve of that or abstain? Great. Okay. So that's a very quick subcommittee, I guess. We'll, uh, and Johanna, I'll, I'll, I'll be in touch. I know you're exhausted after all of these reports, but just give me 48 hours to uh, summarize all these great recommendations. <laughs> I'll, get, I'll, I'll reach out. ASAP. Uh, I think oh, that's it. Can I make Wilson. one? Uh, may I make one other thing? I, I want to make the suggestion that going into next year's inspections, not only do we do it a little bit earlier, but that we sit down with our stakeholders, for example, the Board of Education for the county, and ask them, what are your, what are you, what do you want to know? Um, at every level, what do you want to know, probation, etc. It might also increase our chances of adoption of some things. Um, and also, you know, we are their instruments, even though we think of ourselves as our instruments and the youth's instruments, we, we serve everyone in the system. So that's my recommendation for a strategy for next year. Couldn't agree more that, um, that just despite the fact that our inspections each year are getting better and better and the process more and more thorough, um, I, I agree we, we should look back and, and, and decide you know, how can we improve even more, um, including maybe front loading a little bit more work and, and uh, meeting with those stakeholders. So um, something we can look at in January. Fantastic. Uh, uh, again, thank you, everyone. Uh, kudos to the commission for a great 2022. Uh, this is our last meeting of the year. And with that, we conclude our inspection period for 2022. And, um, and I will work with Commissioner Rasmussen on getting all the letters ready to be sent out to all the appropriate authorities and, and sending them our distributing these inspection reports. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Take care, everybody.